Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Adam. We have Spring at Dawn, and we're in the uh, Roaring Forest. I had to fight some wolves and some bandits on the way here, but uh... Oh, what did I do? That's weird. Alright, uh, there's a hole in the ground. Another hole in the ground. this way. I'm just mapping out the area because I don't know what to expect here. More people hanging out. You go this way. Where does this take you? A shrine. Oh, it's actually roaring. Y'all hear that? There's a stash over there. Okay. Some wolves. Alright, so there's some some fighting to be done here. Nothing too crazy, though. Just some wild animals. Alright, so I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna stick to the left-hand side. Another hole with a log that I can interact with. Okay, there's a lot to do here. So let's get started. Let's go waste some time. Let's talk to these fine people. Your gaze falls upon a young woman of 25 to 30 years of age, who's standing by the fire in a very strange position. Judging by the absence of conversation with her rugged companion or any other activity, she's just resting by the fire, possibly waiting out the night. But at the same time, her body is wrapped up in a tailored winter raincoat. It's, it's straight and tense. Uh, her shoulders are spread out, and on the whole, she looks ready to dart off at any second. Although it's not fear, at least you don't notice this emotion on her face badly lit by the fire. A different, much stranger guest comes to your mind. Uh, the stranger is standing in the at attention position, waiting for some order. Apart from this unexpected thing, you also notice a strange low-pitched buzzing coming from a yellow parcel sticking out of the left pocket of the woman's raincoat. As she notices you, the woman flinches as if she woke from, woke up from a stupor. She quickly draws an outdated reusable metal syringe from within her coat and grabs it by the plunger if she's, as if she was holding a dagger. What? I'm warning you. Another step and I'll have to defend myself. The woman makes a short, sharp nod towards the thick needle that's facing you. The thick steel needle that's facing you. I'll explain. Should this mixture of sodium peroxide and aluminum shavings get in the bloodstream of any of my adversaries, it will turn them into a living torch, let alone let alone a nobody like yourself. The woman goes silent, evidently hoping that the speech she gave will make you flee. Well, if I stand still the whole time during the injection, it might work. But let's not test it and just talk instead. The woman skillfully rotates the syringe in her hand so the needle isn't pointing at you anymore, and demonstratively, as if in a sign of reconciliation, she returns the weapon in the case located under her coat. I agree. In a fight with a living opponent, the substance would probably have lesser effect than a battle against locks, fences, and railings. A talk is much, is much preferable to a fight. I state that not beca just because I'm not sufficiently equipped. I find confrontations pointless even when the power balance is in my favor. I'd be more than happy if we make do with the conversation. Alright, I have a couple of questions. Bowman and slowly exhales. I'm listening. Who are you? Bowman nods to you and gives a short answer. Anastasia B. Uh, nice to meet you. They call me Donald. Bowman nods calmly. Names give a person little grip gravitas, Donald. Much less people giving them credit. Much less than people give them credit for. But I'll remember yours, at least for the time of our communication. Uh, speaking about the communication, let's ask something else. Uh, what's your profession? The woman takes her, takes her time to think about the answer, after which she shrugs. I doubt that my qualifications and titles will be anything more to you than just empty words, and I doubt even more that the place I came here from should be made known to the first stranger I meet. Let me put it simple. I'm a scientist. I began my journey into this anomalous zone five months ago, relying on questionable reconnaissance data as a part of the group of, my, of six of my closest colleagues and comrades. This information should be enough for you to draw necessary conclusions. Alright, uh, what can you tell me about this strange place? The woman presses her thumb against her forehead in an unusual, unknown to you gesture. I believe, I believe I wouldn't reveal anything new if I told you that this place, the Roaring Forest, is an, anom an anomalous zone. Anomalous zone. I cannot read or talk this morning. After all, anyone who has feet to feel to tremors of the earth under them can figure it out. I don't know the reasons for this anomaly. Although I do know... A multitude of theories. One moment, I gotta take a sip of coffee.
My throat is winning this morning. Uh, from the completely nonsensical cryptozoology, zoolog cryptozoological fantasies of the dwellers of the local Ersat states. To the mystical explanations of the local priests who draw a connection between this area and the activity of the forces beyond human comprehension. I reached this place to dispel these theories. One of them in particular, the most ludicrous, the most absurd one. When I'm done with it, the reality, I'm afraid, will turn out to be completely uninteresting. Have you heard anything interesting? I have to disappoint you. Although I don't see much of a problem in talking about this place, an exclusive, well-hidden from the outside world community of specialists that I come from, many years ago has fallen victim to what has started as an absurd, un unsubstantiated theory and continued its existence as a pseudo-religious dogma. Perhaps you're familiar with the concept of quantum immortality, coined by the Western researchers in the pre-war years? The essence of this idea is very simple. The observable universe is just the materialization of one of the multitude of possibilities, a point in infinity, that according to the larger anthropic principle, looks like one of its looks like the one of its kind only because its alternatives are not available to our vision. In reality, the number of universes is endless. Each time someone or something faces a choice, a new world is born. Utilizing colorful metaphors, I'll present the following image. Yesterday, after choosing long and thoroughly between the leg of a mutated ant and rotten flesh of a stray dog, you settled upon the latter for your dinner. According to the theory of the quantum immortality, with your choice, you've created a new universe, where everything happens the way it does in ours. But there, you've chosen the ant's leg for dinner. Here's a more dramatic example. Tomorrow, you're going to meet a gang of criminals and fall, and fall their victim in a roadside ditch. Your death, according to this theory, will create a whole multitude of universes in which you'll have to either run away from your attackers, kill them all during the confrontation, never met them at all, or even died, but slightly different. One way or another, you continue to exist for a potentially infinite amount of time in the frames of infinite number of worlds. Of course, the extent of the theory is much bigger. For each universe where you were born a male, there's one where you were born a female, or weren't born at all. For each universe with a nuclear bomb, there's a dozen where such technology wasn't necessary to develop to the developing humankind. Uh, there's an infinite number of examples. All that, of course, is nothing more than a, th a thought experiment. However, for one of the prominent scientists of my lesser motherland, this theory has turned into a mania, into a fanatical obsession to discover the bridge between our world and an alternative one, and to give our version of humankind an exodus to the universe where the devastating war of the 1986 never happened. After a whole range of suicidal expeditions to the surface, this mysterious force was unfoundedly named the Junction Point, the sigil of the multiverse. I volunteered for an expedition to this place to prove once and for all that our leader's theories are insane, to oust him for his own sake and for the sake of our community, and nothing will stop me. Okay. Well, that was fun. I hear you, dude. You see a pensive looking man of around 40 years old, or maybe 50 already. Tiredly rubbing his forehead with his thumb and his index finger, he's looking through you, through his tiny fire, and through the woman standing opposite him. The darkness of the deep night surrounding you and the uneven, constantly flickering light of fire prevent you from determining not only the man's approximate age, but even his facial features. Everything about him looks blurry, covered in haze. The only thing you can see clearly is his worn out trench coat. It's gray except for about a dozen patches sewn in on it in haste. It's worn it's worn into holes. Apart from that, your gaze is drawn to a whole army of radio parts sticking out of the wide, partially torn pockets of the traveler's unsophisticated apparel. You also take a notice of a retractable Yagi antenna, a whole bunch of transistors, and even a blowtorch, whose serpent-like cable goes deep into the man's suit. As he notices you, the man flinches and with a precise, well-practiced move, draws from underneath his coat something that looks like a pile of scrap metal pressed into a cylinder half a meter long. The man's frightened eye meets you as he points the mysterious aggregate right at you. Whoa, 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 there, Traveler. Uh, now a step closer. Do you see? Do you see my thingy? It's a cryo gun. That's right. I've assembled it myself following the blueprints of the Young Engineer magazine. That's where the liquid nitrogen shoots from. The man points at the rust-eaten tank of butane attached to the device. You'll freeze in an instance. You'll just turn into an icicle. After which a small hummer will shoot from this barrel and, and you'll be blown to smithereens. Do I make myself clear? I'm not being too scientific, am I? To smithereens. Not a single doctor will be able to put you back together after that. Once a man, now a Chinese puzzle. A, a Lamarckin's box. Uh, so there. The man gets silent, evidently hoping the speech he just gave will make you flee. 
I doubt that this thing works, but I have no intention to give it a go. Let's talk. The man cautiously lowers his intricate cylinder to the ground, as if in a sign of reconciliation. Okay, so it's like the same crap as the girl. Well, well. Uh, now, even if you had something apart from talking on your mind, talk would be all I, I, all I could do. I admit that I assembled the cryo gun in haste, pretty much on the run, while trying to escape from the enemies of everything that is new and has mathematical and physical formula. From the enemies of, from the enemies of the science. I hope this conversation doesn't show that you, you too, are a member of the cohort that grows bigger by the day. How can I help you? All right, I have questions. Please ask. Who are you? The man grunts and proudly extends his hand. And asked this Borda, a self-taught physicist at your service. And how is my unexpected in interlocutor known to the world? Uh, they call me Donald. If I ask you permission, the man grabs your hand and starts shaking it energetically. Nice to meet you, Donald. I'm glad to see you in the ranks of, uh, of Out Scientific Concilium. That consists of you, me, and this amazing place full of riddles. Alright, uh, what's your profession? Oh wait, I'm a convinced atheist. Moreover, I'm inclined to think that religious cult is harmful to the masses and is the reason behind most of the world conflicts and a diachronic prospect. But I'm not ashamed to say, for God's sake, ask me anything you want, my friend. For God's sake. What is your profession? The man proudly straightens up. Once a Turner's apprentice, now a free research, a free researcher. So there. A rich collection of popular science magazines that I assembled back in the pre-war years when I was a green youth and that I've read cover to cover allowed me to comprehend many riddles of the universe and expelled me from the comfort and warmth of my native land untouched by the gamma rays and theta waves in search of the discoveries that would improve human condition. I act outside anybody's jurisdiction. I work against the rules. Every man and his dog has robbed me by now, but I keep the faith in the progress, even with total lack of any care or help on the part of the science board of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Whew, there's a lot of reading. What can you tell me about this strange place? Your interlocutor throws his hands up in the air. Oh, comrade, this place is commonly referred to as the Roaring Forest. I've heard all sorts of primitive theories trying to explain why it shakes occasionally. A clandestine underground railway for the surviving members of the Central Committee. A nuclear bomb testing ground in the, in the Earth crust. A secret factory wearing the forest like a hat that day and night produces armored vehicles for the cold-hearted mythical organization called Adam that apparently is tirelessly making ammunition to pre precipitate the destruction of the last survivors on Earth. It's all nonsense. In fact, this place is a physical anomaly that was predicted by the great Coneptalio Arcadi in the July issue of the Young Engineer magazine in the year 65. I read it many times before arriving to this seemingly absurd conclusion. But I digress. Excuse me. Anything interesting? Oh, oh, oh. The man is almost jumping with joy. Have I heard anything interesting? Do I know anything interesting? Comrade, I'm so exalted that I'm barely holding in the mad dance of a primate, a savage who's just discovered fire. You got such a clever look in your eyes. No, I'm not even going to ask you. I'll simply state that you have definitely heard about the theory of plural singularities coined by that same guy that was described in the June issue of the Young Engineer magazine back in the year 65. This genius, who was later tortured by the punitive psychiatry, made an assumption that surpassed all the theories that existed in the world of the big physics so much that it caused no reaction in the scientific community. They, these embodiments of the trivial, perplexed by his piercing wisdom, didn't even laugh. They didn't point at him with their yellow crooked fingers. They just kept silent. They ignored him. But he was so right. The thing is, my friend, that Earth is far from being the only one. I'm sorry, I'm struggling to keep reading all this stuff. It's a lot to read. In exactly the same way as an unnoticeable but very important part of any atom, nicknamed in the West with the odious word quantum, or the way I call it, microsegmentoid, is capable of simultaneously existing in an infinite number of places. The same way our planet can have a potentially infinite number of twins existing in the same space. Okay, so he's talking about the same thing. I'm not going to read all this. He's, he's talking about the uh, same things she was talking about. All right, so I said that he was almost he's as enthusiastic about it as his companion, and his response was, the man flinches and shuts his mouth as he was about to say something. He's, clear, he's clearly scared. Well, a minute passes before he speaks again, showing no sign of his previous joyfulness. Excuse me, but who are you talking about? What do you mean, mate? Are you all right? Who indeed? 
Why, her out there, the lady, pointed the woman standing by the fire. The man stares over his shoulder fearfully. His glance bounces off the foot-worn pieces of the land where the woman is standing, but doesn't focus on her once. The woman is deep in her thoughts and is not even looking at the two of you. Oh, they're in two different dimensions, or they're pretending like they are. Which makes sense, because her name is Anastasia B, and his name is Anastas Borda. I thought they were brother and sister, but no. Maybe they are Oh, that's, that's neat. Perhaps you had the good intentions that are... Perhaps you had good intentions that are only clear to you. But you really scared me, my friend. There's nobody there. And there was nobody there before, either. I was whiling away this night on my own before you came here to keep me company. Well, she's standing right there. The man quietly swallows a lump in his throat and looks at you apprehensively, as if you were a dangerous lunatic. Alright, um, uh, whatever you say. Yeah, there she is, that woman. I see her. Wow, she's cool. Your, inter your interlocutor coughs embarrassingly and carefully steps away from you. Alright, so that's interesting. That's a cool little, uh... Nod. Can I go down this hole? Well, this is like the first fallout, then all I need to do is equip some rope. Right, can I climb out of this hole? I mean, oh, that's probably what the, uh... That tree was over the hole. I want to kill this deer. And that's free experience. Come here. Oh, you're trapping yourself, friendo. Oh, no, I can't touch the green because I'll get sucked out of here. Alright, let's just uh, keep exploring. I'm not going to talk to the other guys yet. I'm going to focus on exploring the rest of this area before I talk to the other campfire. Because, uh... It's a lot of reading. Not that I don't, not that I mind reading, it's just reading out loud for extended periods of time. Alright, uh... Alright, so that's where they are. I don't want to go here yet. Let's go the other way first. Oh, spiders. And spider brains, ooh. I also fought some spiders off camera. Now, let's see, that should put me at... Yeah, 12, 14, because that's picked up two. So I need 20 for that guy's quest, so six more. Oh, holy crap, it's right there. So if we go this way, there's a few directions we can take. We can go this way, which leads back to the campfire. So we're not going that way. So what I can do is start by going this way. Deal with these wolves. Let me equip my frying pan. Alright. Come here, wolves. Oh, there's... Two more than I thought they were. Sorry, I can tank this. He might not be able to tank this, though. I should probably move over here and help him. I could also just swing at this guy twice and potentially kill him. Oh, 
Oh no. Oh well, never mind. They don't do a lot of damage. I'm o I'm okay. Yeah, Fidel's yeah. We're fine. Oh wow, sixteen jeez. Ha! Killed him outright. Um, I will take meat. Actually, hold on. Let's uh, go use a campfire real quick. Because you can do that. Uh, if you cook meat, it heals you for a good amount. I was getting between 11 and 13 health back for eating cooked meat at a campfire. A bunch of mushrooms. So right up here, I'm just going to eat some meat. And then uh, go collect some more meat. Yeah, 13 health points. One more. There we go. Pack up to full health. Because I have a whole bunch of meat in my inventory. Or, I guess Fidel has a bunch of meat in his inventory. Alright, so yeah, we came from that way. We keep track of it by the, the trail of blood we're leaving behind. Fidel, come here. Got some meat for you, bud. I'm still encumbered. Okay, uh, we'll just drop some some stuff. Uh, what to drop? I guess I just drop some meat, right? So they're four a piece. Alright, well, let's continue. Can't do anything with that deer. That just loops around here. Well, may as well check it out, see if there's anything up there worth grabbing. Probably not. We came from that way, so there's only this way left to go. Let's make sure there's no loot sitting up here or any animals I can kill for experience. See? Rubles and canned meat. So this is 7 to 10. And if I cook meat, how much does it heal me for? 3 to 7. Oh, if I eat it raw, though. Yeah, 7 to 10. Where's the canned meat at? Oh, because I'm trading. I keep forgetting that in the trade menu. All right. Where am I going? This is a long ways back here. Might be something back here as well. I should be watching my guy in case there's more stashes I can find. Doesn't matter, we'll run back out this way, so. It'll be okay. So this actually looks like the hole that's on the overworld. When you look at this area. Alright, so once again, I'm gonna go back around the map real quick. So this is where they were standing. This is where we came in from, right? Yep. This is a dead end. Then I guess the other paths are only from going the other way past their camp. bunnies. Yeah, so there's a stash there. And there's three paths over here. One leads to like that totem, totem pole. Alright, cool. 
see what we can do with this. I'm assuming I can tie a rope to this, right? Let's quick save. Or do anything stupid. An earth mount is towering in front of you. There's a scary looking black hole in the middle of it. A fallen tree that lies that lies across the entrance to the underworld could help you with the descent. That is, if you have spare rope, of course. Now let's listen to the sounds first. At first, it seems that not a sound is coming out of the hole. Although, if you listen really attentively, then you can hear distant rustling and creaking. You shake your head in doubt. Smell the hole? The smell of wet ground is coming out of the hole's depth. Although, this smell is accompanied by another, a barely noticeable, sickly sweet one. Although, it's rotting flesh that smells like that. Oh. Usually it's rotting flesh that smells like that. Throw the stone down there? You pick up a small stone from the ground and throw it into the hole. Quite soon you hear it land on the stony floor of the underground. The hole is clearly no more than a three meters deep. However, it would be really careless to jump in with there without a rope. I could just jump in anyway. Um, tie over the rope to the tree. You get a coil of the rope and tie one of its ends to the trunk of the fallen tree with a sturdy sailor's knot. The other end you carefully lower down into the darkness. Descend down the rope into the hole. You spin on the palms of your hands and carefully begin to descend. Suddenly you get a very unpleasant surprise. Perhaps your rope is rotten or you have underestimated your weight, but halfway down the rope snaps and you fall. Well that's not good. We only f fall uh, one and a half meters. That's not... What a fall. Good job your bones didn't break, although there's no way back for you now. Okay, what do we got in here? The heck are you? It's not a spider. It only has six legs. I'm trying to look for dead ends, so I know where to explore first. Wow, look at this water. It could just be a really bad texture, and you're just looking... Like, it looks like it's a really bad texture. Yeah, it is, because of how it moves. Well, maybe. It could just be really... Reflective water as well, because it looks like the sky above. But it could be a portal to another dimension. Ew. Well, let's hold nest of these things. This area is huge. There's an exit. Oh, there's so many of these darn things in here. There's a big one. Alright, so I think I'm going to go to the left first, because I don't think there's an exit this way, right? No, this looks like a bunch of dead ends. Okay. There's a way... If I find a way across here... Wow, it just keeps going. Another exit. I'm going to fight all those darn... creatures. Alright, let's start by... Uh... I don't know. A lot of... Oh, hey, skeleton. They all like the peaked cap. Uh, bought a new pre-war map from the Stool Pigeon and Grishka and Ultranoye. It shows the place where some pre-war treasure is buried. Well, actually, there's like a historical treasure. No more details. But if it's really a treasure, then there'll be a buyer. The map itself is from some olden university or it's a historic department. This is this is hard to read. That is, of course, if you trust Gishka, if you, and you don't trust no one. Besides me and Leolik, we decided to take our expedition to Dashka the pickpocket, the best con woman in all of Krasno, and Stiopa the knife, the most experienced hitman in all of Paragon. I carry a load, Leolik shows the way, Stiopa the knife keeps an eye on the road, and Dashka carries some chemical serum and a spike. She says that thing can make anyone strongman with just one injection. Although nobody ever injected, so hell knows if it works how it really works. We decided to share the treasure like between brothers. Well, and sisters because of Dashka. Each gets equal part no matter what treasure it turns out to be. I like that, although of course I don't really trust my mates. The good thing is that they don't trust each other too. So me thinks no one will betray no one because no one trusts no one. Holy crap, okay. <laughs> we reached the forest, but we can't find the cave marked on the Grishka's map. So them two elder folks who live in the forest tell us that there's another entrance to the underground nearby. They warn us that it's dangerous there, but there's no way that we're going to listen to them. We ain't scared of dangers, and the oldies must be happy we didn't whack them, because we could. We decided to go down in the morning, so we set up camp in front of the hole and wait out the night. And me don't like that the guy whispers something between them. Maybe they're plotting some against I. Tomorrow we see. If 
anything, I'm strongest than them three. Just they try to whack me and take all treasure. I know they think me dumb. Big mistake. Me not that stupid as them think. Most likely I'll whack them, they miss me self. It's just... <laughs> oh. It's morning. I stayed up all night. And them, I guess, noticed that or they would sure try to kill me in my dream. Dream? But they were chatting between them. Quiet. But I hear. They decided to get rid of me down in the hole. No chance. I'm preparing for fight underground. I didn't have sleep, but the chances are on my side. Treasure will be mine. Oh yeah, you can keep your notebook. Well, that was interesting. So I wonder, because we saw another dead body further ahead. Let's fight one of these guys. See what they're capable of. Wait a minute. What's that beast in the quarters? It's eating the earth. Probably that's what makes the forest shake from time to time. Alright, so they are hostile. I was going to see if... uh. Alright, they can't take too much damage. They deal with average damage. Okay, it's not too bad. I was expecting like an extreme difficulty spike. Can't loot it? No? Just highlights its dead body. Oh, that's interesting. Alright, so I can go three ways. This way which leads to the diggers. This way also leads to the diggers. Now let's check out this room with the uh, the weird water. Or circle back this way. There's another dead body. Probably have been recording. Poor soul got unlucky. The marks on the bones clay point to the violent death. If anybody's reading this, they should know that Dashka the pickpocket is a scum and a turt bag. We've made an agreement with her that after we get rid of the hoodlum, Leolic the peaked cap would be next. After which we would have to split the mysterious treasure 50-50. But no. Instead she decided to, to get together with that butthole Leolic. In case this note wasn't found on my dead body, then I guess Dashka didn't betray me after all, and I just lost the note. Although the chances of this are very slim. Thank you for your attention, Stefan the Knife. Alright, so I have a feeling that they all thought they were going to betray each other, and they ended up betraying each other because they thought they were going to betray each other. Oh, jeez. Did someone land on that spike? Is that a mole rat? Alright, well, let's go fight the mole rat. It's a dead end, so... No harm in it. Where you at, bud? Oh, you're, I'm poisoned. Son of a gun. Alright, let's drink some water. Did I just get more poisoned? Okay. But how am I drinking poisoned water? All right, I have other water somewhere, right? He's got water for me. Oh, I was probably standing in his uh that when that thing exploded. Oh, hey, don't go up there yet. I'm encumbered and all that jazz. Uh, food? Where's my water at? I could drink it over time and it would, uh... Or I thought it stacked. I guess not. Alright, well, let's go fight this thing. Twenty-nine... Okay. Run away! Screw that. Fidel, come back! <laughs> he just books in the other direction. Alright, let's reload. Alright, you got your guns on you, bud? Yeah, let's give you some ammunition for this fight.
Actually, how you feeling? Here. Alright, let's go. Alright, Fidel, I'm gonna try and cut him back to you. There we go. I'm gonna hold the line here, Fidel. His name is called... he's called Blind Death. Oh, he's almost dead. Alright, I'm gonna try and kill this before the episode, and then we'll, uh... Worry about the rest. Alright, I'm encumbered, so I need to get rid of some crap. Why is my poison going up? Where, where's an antidote at? Let me just take that. Jeez. Alright, where... I'm poisoning it. Why does it keep going up? Am I being poisoned because we're down here? Alright, well, shoot, now I'm too encumbered. Ah, crap. Alright, let's go. I'm just gonna tank it. Come on, Fidel. I need you to come in. Come with me. I need you to be close. There we go. Good job, bud. Oh, yeah. It's only done 13 now. All right. Yeah, we got this. We got this. Nope. Okay. Um. Oh, I just fell through the ground. I might call the episode here then. Uh, I don't know if we can take this guy or not. I definitely need to be more mobile, so I can't be, uh... Yeah, darn. I can't wear the shield. Just have to run away from him as we go. I'm gonna take an antidote, though. Maybe an onion? Increase my endurance? What's up, bud? Good shot, Fidel. Oh man, he knocked me down. Son of a gun. Yeah, I think if I get knocked down, it's a death sentence. It's definitely a death sentence if I get knocked down. I might have to come back to this guy. I think we can do it, though. Well, until he does something like that, and I'm dead. Dang, man. Maybe I need to heal sooner. Yeah, I think as long as I don't get knocked down, I'll be fine. But as soon as I get knocked down, it's game over for me. So I have to keep getting uh, lucky, I hope. I'll just hold my ground. No, because then he gets like three attacks on me, and I don't, I don't want that. So let's cut him back this way. Holy crap, yeah, and I just got one shot. This is ridiculous. I might have to use this shield and just drop everything in my inventory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know how I want to handle this. Alright, one more, one more try and then I'll call it an episode. 
Who knows, this might be my, uh... Nope, I just took 50. <laughs> it's getting worse. Alright, well, I'm gonna call the episode here. In the next one, we'll, uh... Try fighting this thing some more. It's called Blind Death. And it heals when it damages me. What? Alright, we might have to come back here later. And we can just keep exploring. Maybe there'll be, like, something for me to use to kill him with. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I hope to see y'all in the next episode.